expected or seen this, uh, people are hesitant. So we'll have to see how the consumption patterns work out. Therefore, policy makers must look at appropriate stimulus. Rakeshji, you've had a long and varied career in economic policy making. So what we'd like today perhaps to talk about are some of the views as uh, some of the things as you see developing in this economy and what ought to be done. And uh, if I could request you to also to talk about not what is seen right now, but the sort of impact this will have looking ahead in the medium term. Let's not talk of the long term uh, and how uh, this can be done. You've always been advocating, you know, some kind of fiscal stimulus to absorb shocks and bring back buoyancy. And, uh, you know, how your experience in terms of issues around consumption or demand-based uh, focus versus or and or an investment-based focus. So how does India really um, deal with this issue? Uh, <clears throat> what can the private sector do? Uh, and what, what is their role? Inflation is another issue with the easy money availability globally as well as uh, low rates in India, which will continue uh, as per RBI. Although RBI is keeping a close watch on inflation, but what role could inflation play? Can it be a spoil sport? How do we manage these issues and, uh, and all of this? So it is issues like this. Uh, and, and one other important point, if I may highlight, which is really about the informal or the less organized part of our economy. See, the numbers that we see, uh, the news that we read is much more about um, uh, the organized parts. But where, in your view and experience, is this um, other informal part or the less organized part of the economy? How badly do you think they have been impacted? And then on the whole, uh, on the economy as a whole, how would this... Um, uh, is it likely to impact? And therefore, the numbers that we see, are they, are they the real numbers or there is something beyond that? So it is this kind of thing which I hope to uh, engage you in conversation and we get the wisdom of your, uh, your insights and views. Um, so Rakesh Ji, with these words, a uh, very warm welcome again. And uh, um, delighted to have you uh, and also as president of CSEP uh, on this platform. So over to you, Rakesh. You may want to make some some broad remarks, initial remarks, and we can get into more depth as you like and talk about that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Harsh, uh, first for honoring me with this uh, invitation. Uh, it is only the handicap of having known you for such a long time that I had no choice but to accept. Uh, I'm saying this uh, partly seriously because um, I have mostly been away from the country for in and out, but most of them out for almost 10 years, from 2010 to the time I came back in October of 2020. Um, so in some sense, I've been sort of out of touch. Uh, obviously, I did track as much as I could from my perch at Yale University. Um, but nonetheless, it, that, that doesn't substitute for the normal um, interaction that one has uh, living in the country. Second, of course, uh, after coming back, I mean, in some sense, I've not been back in the country. I've been back in my house in Delhi. Um, so, you know, one and, and coming back after 10 years, one would have met many friends, many of you, so many friends I see uh, on this call. Um, so I'm just saying all this basically as a caveat that you will have to allow me some degree of um, um, uh, handicap in terms of not really knowing what's going on. Um, furthermore, of course, that uh, data, in this of current data are very difficult as Harsh kind of implied in, in some sense in his remarks, um, because, um, you know, in this ongoing epidemic with all kinds of lockdowns, of course, nationwide lockdown last year, now in the last uh, couple of months, state-wise lockdowns, city-wise lockdowns, uh, obviously data gathering has become very, very difficult. Um, so, uh, having said all that, I think that all of what I've been saying often is 
that in talking about any issues today, whether it's the whether it's the spread of the epidemic, the pandemic, whether it's economic current observations plus forecasts, we have to we have to exercise a reasonable degree of humility in terms of really not knowing very well what's going on apart from impressions that we get. And of course, just sitting at home, uh, just watching things on television, seeing data coming out, etc., uh, without being able to interact is a further handicap. Now, um, some of the issues that you, I'll, I'll try and address uh, uh, slowly. Um, one thing we need to, of course, recognize is that the economy was slowing down very significantly even before the outbreak of COVID-19 last year. And that's very important in understanding. Relative to the first decade of this century, that is say 2002 to 2012 or something of that order, when investment rates, uh, gross investment rates have gone up about 38% uh, plus, um, which had produced a very high growth of 8% 8, 8 plus a year during that period, have indeed been coming down uh, since 2012 or so. And you can't get growth on a sustained basis in investment rates. Consumption debt growth, yes, is has limitations because you really have to invest both in infrastructure as well as the productive uh, capacities, which has been slowing down uh, since 2012 or thereabouts. So uh, the problem that we have is that on top of something that is slowing down anyway, we then have this global global shock. Um, the the, the uh, and of course, uh, we need, in, in terms of the current situation, uh, we need to recognize that the COVID is still continuing with a great deal of global uncertainty. Now, there is some uh, optimism, of course, uh, particularly with, uh, say, the United States, the largest economy in the world, uh, recovering quite well as of now with a high level of vaccinations. Um, but, uh, you know, it is 60% of the population, as far as I understand, which does still mean that 40% is not yet vaccinated. So one doesn't, one just does not know what might happen. Similarly, in our own case, of course, uh, by February or so, uh, you know, we had very few cases, both countrywide and citywide, citywide. And so most of us had really thought that maybe we have got some kind of herd, herd immunity, and that India was doing well. But then we had this huge surge, huge absolute surge uh, in the second wave. The point of mentioning this is only that we do need to still understand that we have to exercise an extreme degree of caution all around in our personal behaviors, but also in expectations of what may happen because there's just, we just don't know. Um, now, one of the impacts that this might have um, is from the consumer side that whereas I would have thought that after, after the first wave in a sense, when, uh, the pan when the epidemic had really come down in India over three, four months, say November to February, something like that, um, there was some degree of confidence that was emerging in cons among consumers that look, this is now over or this is about to be over and we can now continue with kind of normal life. Now that I would imagine, and this is sort of uh, uh, corroborated by some consumer surveys I reported in the RBI report, uh, recent report, um, that one would imagine that um, consumers must be really hit now after the second wave with a great degree of uncertainty, just not knowing what will happen in the future. And in any case, uh, given the income problems uh, in the last uh, one year, uh, some surveys suggest that 93% of people have suffered uh, 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 falls in income. So given that if 93% of people have suffered falls in income, except for the super rich, um, that in any case, consumer demand will be subdued. On top of that, if there is this kind of caution that look, I've suffered uh, lots of income loss, I better be careful and keep something for the rainy day. So it could be, that consumer demand might be muted in the months to come relative to what we might have expected in January, February. Again, I hasten to say that look, these are all speculative observations because one just doesn't have enough information and what people are obviously thinking. Um, one bright spot in some sense is 
that uh, uh, I've been kind of surprised pleasantly that the manufacturing sector um, has done relatively well in managing their production facilities, uh, basically ever since the lockdown ended last year, in being able to figure out ways and means of running their facilities despite all the difficulties. Once again, um, one doesn't know how much impact the second wave will have on the availability of labor and the return of labor uh, from uh, their ho home places where they may have again gone off, uh, even though of course lockdown was not so hard as it was last year. And that of course, you all will have a much, much, much better sense than I do because you actually run companies, which I don't, I just sit at home and try and figure out what you, what you people are doing all the time. But nonetheless, that does seem to me uh, that the manufacturing sector has uh, coped relatively well, I think perhaps better than we would have expected, given what has happened. So having said all this, um, the number one economic policy measure has to be vaccinate. A friend of mine uh, said the V-shaped recovery actually means V for vaccination. So it's the first, the, the, the key policy measure has to be vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. And I welcome the change in vaccination policy that the Prime Minister announced a few days ago. I would go further, that it should be free to everyone, uh, regardless of income, etc., because it is a true public good. Um, second, um, that uh, one could, of course, say that those who can afford it um, should be asked uh, to, to give money, to donate. And most of us, I think, would happily do that, even higher than the thousand rupees a shot uh, that people talk about, that, that is now going to be charged for the private sector. Because the point is that given the spread of private sector health facilities in the country, that we should be using them to to have as many vaccinations as possible, 10, minimum 10 million a day. This will be the biggest uh, shot in the arm, to, without meaning a pun, biggest shot in the arm uh, for the economy, the faster we can do this. And I mean, if it costs 45,000 crores, what the hell if I may use uh, 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 informal language? I mean, if the government can afford to give all of you fat cats, 200,000 crores, 200,000 crores in PLI over five years, um, then you can't do 40,000 crores a year for vaccinations. It doesn't make any sense to me. In fact, one of the things, Harsh, you said that what can the private sector do? Private sector should say to the government, Hame atma hai. Hame aapke subsidy nahi please, do not, don't, please, please do not insult us by giving uh, subsidies through PLI of 200,000 crores in five years. Just imagine how many schools, how many hospitals, how many public health facilities, how much sanitation, et cetera, you can do over 200,000 crores in five years. So and that's, I think, the private sector can do. should tell the government, look, we are capable of producing, we are capable of being competitive. Uh, please don't give us this money. Please spend it in ways so that it strengthens us in our activities. Um, so, so much, sir, for the, for the immediate term. But Harsh, I'll stop there for a second so you can maybe ask me more pointed questions. Thank you very much, uh, I think, but that was a good, uh, great start. And I, I would agree with you entirely that we, uh, and I, I love the way that you pointed it to say that the V recovery stands for vaccination. And I think we should, we should actually uh, sort of uh, Communicate this more, uh, more vocally because it is true, and I, I think the so so just picking on that point. See the whole issue which you you have you have uh, mentioned rightly so, and I, I I would think also that this time around uh, with all the horror stories that one hears, and frankly, each and every one of us has uh, witnessed or has been unfortunately impacted in some way or the other. We have lost friends, relatives. There's not one person, I suppose, on this call who can say that they haven't uh, or, or seen many people struggle. So 
you know, and and particularly when we talk of, you know, you remember I was having a conversation with you some time back for this that I believe statistically I don't have all the statistics in front of me, but I believe that savings rates in India, particularly going from quarter two of last fiscal downwards, had had come down very significantly, and they had come down to about. 10% or something in quarter 2 and maybe even i don't know what happened quarter 3 but with this kind of scenario how would we expect people to come back and and actually spend uh what are your thoughts on that but if i may just add one 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 point the prime minister's announcement of extension of uh, ration up till diwali that is november i suppose could also help alleviate some of that so and, and you've also mentioned the whole issue of uh, hesitant consumer spending for reasons that you have given as well so can we talk a little bit more in terms of that and how we can sort of orchestrate some other countries have had experiences in you know china did some coupons uh uh the uk of course the different kind of economy talked about the dining out kind of a thing so at least get the service industry back and going so some thoughts around that rakesh in terms of the consumer side sentiment demand creation yeah i think that uh, first of all as you said uh, the extension of the free ration scheme till november is it's very very welcome um i have no idea how well it's being administered uh, i just hope that it it is being well administered so that at least people get uh, enough uh, enough to eat um just to put that in context actually this is uh, in, in some sense pre covid actually that one of the most um, one, one of the most distressing figures that came out of the national family health survey then i think in 2017 18 is that or more than one third of indian children are stunted i'll just repeat that more than one third of indian children are stunted that uh, let to put that in context china had a similar figure by the way uh, in the in the early 1990s uh, now in china that has come down to less than 5% in the last 30 years um, and so uh, my my point there is that in, this is in the context of the free rations that uh, it, it's both in, an immediate issue because of covid but also a much more longer term issue on how do we how do we ensure adequate nutrition to the poorest because it is a health issue for both of both obviously for mothers which causes people to be causes children to be stunted and of course lack of lack of nutrition so i think that uh, i'm sort of mixing up the covid related uh, extension of ration scheme which is very very welcome but i think this is also a good time to the extent that the government both at the central state local levels gets experience on how to administer this kind of a, a food scheme in to 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 the less well off among us because the point about the stunting is that um, a stunted child can't learn and one of the good things that has happened last 20 years is that we now do have almost 100% attendance in theoretical attendance in primary school at primary school level um so uh, but at the same time we have surveys uh, uh, which, which, which which from pratham uh, so to to the annual survey of, of education is uh, showing that yes uh, enrollment has increased tremendously but outcomes are not so good and outcomes have actually deteriorated in terms of there is some a, a kid class 5 or 6 not being able to do even class 1 or class 2 reading level and my point about mentioning this in this context even though going beyond your question is that if a if one third of children are stunted they somehow going to school they can't absorb what's been taught and therefore it's no wonder that you then have bad outcomes so uh, i'm just connecting this for the medium term that a recovery now what does this mean that if children to one third are stunted it means that one third of labor force 20 years from now we have low productivity and therefore what i'm sort of saying is that we should use the current situation for learning on how to tackle this on a 
longer term, uh, longer term uh, basis. Uh, second thing I would say is that now that we've had uh, the sort of jam that is um, uh, Jangan, uh, uh, Aadhaar, and mobile uh, system now for five years or more, that um, given the experience that we've had, and by the way, much better than most countries, uh, and certainly ahead of the United States. So I mean, it was in some sense amusing to see the United States that so many of the unemployment checks and subsidies that are going out to millions of people are going out in hard, hard checks and hard paper. They cannot do the kind of electronic transfer that we can on a, on a, on a, uh, a widespread basis. So we are ahead of the developed countries in, in, in many issues, which we can use, as you are sort of suggesting, uh, uh, that, that we can do much more cash transfers. But I don't have enough knowledge, actually, quite frankly, to know in some sense where that needs to be focused on. Because clearly, I don't need a cash transfer. No one in this call needs a, needs a cash transfer, except that you're getting it through PLI. Um, that um, um, the, the, so the, you're absolutely right that I think one needs more information and data, and which presumably the government must have in some forms, and where to focus that so that consumption uh, is improved to the extent that you provide that we are providing free food uh, to a certain class of people 800 million in the people in the country you then you then uh, freeing up um, uh, whatever other money they have to buy other things second thing i would say is to given that we have this mechanism of transferring cash um, it should clearly we should clearly have a program to uh, uh, provide health expenses, particularly related to COVID, anyone who gets it. And again, given that you do have the information system, again, because of our uh, IT system, whoever gets COVID, it seems to me that it should be practical that people don't go bankrupt, which many people must be going to bankrupt, getting into debt, et cetera, in getting COVID treatment. So that, that'll be another uh, area where if the government can provide, if it's feasible, and if we have the systems to transfer money to people who suffer from COVID, then that will again free up uh, consumption expenditures for other things to propel the economy forward. That's about the only idea that I can have at this point, Ash. Okay, but thank you. I mean, no, I, look, there are, there are no easy answers to this. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I suppose one has to balance uh, this part of it. Now, in our conversation, you also uh, said that, you know, the manufacturing sector, you were surprised that it was managing its facilities well after the first wave and so on. But I want us to think about one other thing. Uh, and um, and I, I mentioned this in my, in, my, in my opening remarks that, you know, the data that we have, and you also said very clearly data is difficult to come by. The data that we have or, or we get familiar with, or at least we get uh, in reasonable time, is about the organized sector. So, you know, if I take an example to say that our companies being organized, we have information, we have data. But the depth of information that I have about our smaller suppliers and the MSMEs, and more importantly, in terms of their financial health, is not that easy to come by. And frankly, we see it also as, as a user on a practical basis. We see that more when, you know, you say the supply is not coming or there's a constraint and then you get down and understand that there is an issue. So one of the big concerns which has been there, with a lot of, and, and by the way, there are many questions on the chat and, and several of them, by the way, also pertain to some of these issues about MSMEs. So the question is this, are MSMEs a black... Well, I won't say MSMEs alone, but the informal sector added a black box. And therefore, and I, I'm exaggerating the point to make the black box, no disrespect meant, uh, a black box, which we are really, we don't know too much about. And so we get, you know, carried away or our policy responses are more based on the data we have, which is the organized sector. So quarter four, everybody was being euphoric, there's a V-shaped recovery. And there were some people talking about a K-shaped recovery. Uh, so how do we, what's your understanding to whatever extent, 
as an as as somebody who understands the economy with your hunch your your experience as to this informal sector and the impact it would have or it could have on our overall economic recovery um, yeah and maybe yeah. Yeah, yeah, might so I, I don't really I mean, since one as you said one doesn't have the information um, i don't really have much of an understanding on this but i, I would just offer a couple of observations one that i presume that at least those smses who have banking relationships which would mostly be with public sector banks but presumably also with private sector banks one would assume that there is that if if the authority is wanted they can get that information on which how many and which individually which enterprises are having difficulty um uh, from through the banking system and maybe through nbfcs for that matter um because they know all their clients they know which client is having difficulty um also uh, they, they do have information on which clients have uh, chosen to take advantage of the debt moratoriums and so on so my point is only that i presume that at least those smses small micro small medium which have banking relationships in principle there should be enough information if you wanted to collect it and then have a program on how to then address their problems uh, and i have no illusion that that's, that's not easy uh, because they, there's also a moral hazard in the sense of i mean uh, giving uh, uh, giving help to people who have difficulty in obviously not giving help to people who have not had difficulty those will saying look they are you giving out money to these guys or less efficient than i am and so i'm suffering so yes i understand it won't be easy but all my point is that to address these things in real time and say over the next two years um that you you presumably it's, it's feasible to get this information second i would say for the real informal real informal sector who don't even have banking relationships um you just need to do some kind of what you might call local level um um uh, service local level information gathering because purely as a hunch all of us can see that uh, all the sort of komcha walas etc so um, thousands of hundreds of thousands of them must have suffered tremendously because they just, you know you you they're not around and yes they might have come back uh, to life uh, say between september and october and and, and february but they again have gone back so uh, there wouldn't be any national level information on them but it does seem to me that it, it is within the powers of government to actually focus on this and maybe also use uh, industry associations and ngos and so on to try and figure out how do we help them because one of the things that of course i was sitting abroad at the time and observing the mass migration of migrant workers going back uh, but there was almost no talk that not everyone is not everyone who's a either in formal sector labor worker or formal sector worker is a migrant right and there there are millions of people who just live in our cities and work and they sort of presumably they must have suffered as much as the migrants did migrants have the option of going back to their villages and getting some sustenance whereas the people who the the informal sector workers and formal sector workers who lost their jobs in cities have no option again one doesn't know how they have survived so all i'm saying is look i don't know but it does seem to me that there can be a multi pronged initiative central government can't do everything but central government state government city governments and really trying to figure ways out on how do we help and the point of this is that if we that if we don't want the the the, the damage done by covid uh, along with the associated lockdowns to have a longer term impact what you want to do is look on the one hand you're doing welfare measures for the present so that people don't suffer second we want people to recover enough that they can then generate economic activities in the medium term future uh, and in that context i would say that that uh, the reserve bank's financial stability report in december i think it was um speculated uh that uh, npas would grow up to something like 13.6% of gross npas of advances 
I presume that because of the second wave, that number will go up. Now, what this also means is that as this number goes up, our financial system's ability to help with the revival of growth as we do recover from COVID, hopefully after the end of this calendar year, that it will become difficult for them because of the high NPAs that they will have suffered. So once again, we need to find ways and means of addressing that. Now, one thing good the government has done is that uh, we're setting up the so-called bad bank. And so hopefully that will help in cleaning out banks' balance sheets. But we need to accelerate the, 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 the formation of that and accelerate the transfer of bad assets to that institution and then the functioning of AMCs to actually uh, work with those institutions so that we can clean balance sheets of, of banks so that, that they can get back to, uh, back to business. The, the, the problem here that I'm focusing on is the problem was bad enough in, in terms of credit growth before COVID. Now it's going to be more difficult. And I'm glad I'm not uh, either in the government or in the Reserve Bank <laughs> have to solve these problems. Um, so I can only spout forth in some sense without adequate information. Uh, but seriously, I mean, it is a serious situation. And the more analysis, the more government reaches out in different ways to solve these problems and recognize these problems, the better, and make them more transparent so that solutions can be found. Great. Um, thank you. I, I, I think you put, in, uh, you put that in, in good perspective in terms of you know, dealing with the health issue and how do we bring back... Um, uh, some of the consumer demand. There is no easy way, uh, unfortunately, as you are also saying. But I think your, your suggestions about even doing smaller localized informal services is very important because it's actually that segment which has been affected much more. And, and that's for us to see. We can see it visually and visibly. So I, and, and they're all part of the consuming economy at the end of the day. That's why they're important you know, from, from an economic angle as well. So it's, it's very important. But, you know, I'm... I'm also happy for you that you are no longer uh, having the, the responsibility to shoulder in the Reserve Bank, but I can't help asking you this question, which, which by the way, uh, uh, there are some others who, who raised that, and uh, even our, our, our Vice President Srinivas Tempo has this question to say about this printing money issue. So therefore, let, let's look at this way. I'll, I'll put it in this perspective. Investment-led growth and infrastructure or whatever government infra, you know, investment-led growth a ballooning deficit scenario. And then with some specter of inflation. But of course, uh, this whole age-old debate about printing money and should we let our deficit go and not worry about that because uh, the, you know, the urgent is much more important than the immediate. Uh, your thoughts on that? Because you have a huge amount of experience. You've seen it from both sides as an economist, as an operating person in Reserve Bank, and as somebody who's practically seen the effect of the economy. Uh, your thoughts on that? So one, um, it's never clear what people mean by, it's never clear what people mean by printing money. Okay. Um, now, uh, and I certainly don't understand uh, what is meant by printing money. Having said that, um, I said right at the beginning, when I was asked at the beginning of the pandemic, that um, the, government, uh, the, the government should not hesitate to do whatever it can and, and even have higher fiscal deficits in order to do what it should to, to address the problems raised by the, by the pandemic. So I don't get that worried, uh, quite frankly, by higher fiscal deficit. Of course, within some limit. It, it can't be limitless, clear. Uh, and I'd said at that time also, uh, about a year ago, that the government should not worry about uh, credit rating agencies, especially because we don't do external sovereign borrowing. Uh, so it doesn't have a direct effect on uh, what sovereign credit rating agencies do. Of course, it does affect the private sector in the sense that to the extent it does any foreign borrowing, 
of course, their interest rates would be, the, the cost of borrowing would go up. Um, so that is one that I'm I'm that to the extent that government needs to uh, raise its deficit, either to provide free food that we've talked about, which it is doing. Second, if it is need if it needs to ramp up the Manrega uh, employment guarantee scheme, and if it needs to think of, of some of a similar guarantee scheme. Uh, for, for urban employment, which is of course much, much more difficult to actually administer, then I think that so those kind of expenditures, plus at the same time, uh, if we can step up any infrastructure expenditures, I think it shouldn't hesitate to do that by raising, by raising borrowing. Now, um, given the activity that is of that, through the GSAP program, uh, the Government Securities Asset pro Program, um, that um, th there's huge excess liquidity in the market, so that the Reserve Bank is absorbing more than four lakh crores a day. There's four lakh crores a day excess liquidity in the system. So there's no shortage of liquidity. If the government borrows, wants to borrow more, there's no shortage of liquidity. All the banks are doing is putting it in reverse repo. And in mm -hmm. fact, banks will get a high return by putting it, say, 10-year paper, if it, if it is available, if, if it was there. So what I'm saying is, that this is kind of a theoretical question that many people have said, print money. I don't know what it means. Practically speaking, what I am saying is, yes, the government needs to be clear on what are productive expenditures through investment, what are, what are clear uh, needed consumption and welfare expenditures are needed. They should not hesitate in doing that, including greater help to state governments and maybe local governments. Um, and there's no, no shortage of liquidity. And in any case, the, 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 the Reserve Bank can, can operate in the secondary market. What I would not want is for the Reserve Bank to directly lend to the government, uh, which we stopped in 1996, 97. As it, was a long, it, it had been there for 30 years or thereabouts. Uh, it's been a long struggle uh, through the FRBM Act as well to stop that. And I, and I think we should not engage in that. And as, as I said, there's no need because there's no shortage of liquidity in the, in the system. I would also go on to say that if there was an issue, if there was an issue, I would, if I, that in the current situation, I would be willing to consider that, but only on an extreme basis. But there's no need uh, with the kind of excess liquidity that exists in the system. Um, now, there is an issue globally that is being discussed with not very good answers, um, that given the huge expansion of liquidity globally, there are some indications of inflation going up. Now, if that happens globally, um, um, interest rates will go up, nominal interest rates will go up, uh, and that can have a backwash effect on us. So we have to watch that very, very carefully. Um, what, as I understand, what's been hap what is happening there is that particularly as the demand is coming back in particularly the two largest economies that is U.S. and China, um, that there could be some supply disruption, that there, that there may, be the, may be the case, that the, the demand could be going up faster than, than, than supply is able to come back, either because of supply chain issues uh, or whatever. Uh, um, uh, shipping issues and so on. So there are some indications of, we know commodity prices are going up and almost every commodity, oil prices, steel prices, everything. Um, the information from China also is that there are price pressures emerging in China uh, because they also, they do seem to have some supply disruptions domestically, uh, which are pushing up prices well as, as demand is, is ramped up. So I think that that is an issue. In the medium term, however, I'm not as concerned about uh, inflation because globally, certainly uh, the West, North America, Western Europe, or, or Europe as a whole actually, and China, most many parts of East Asia, the demographics of the medium term in terms of low birth rates and population not increasing and aging, that you're not looking at a continued surge in consumption, which would be a different problem of slow growth, actually. 
uh, whereas we probably have, we continue to have excess production capacity in the world. So I'm not that bothered about a big inflation surge in the global economy, but there may be some short term or short medium term issues because of the disruptions that have, that have taken place and fueled of course by excess liquidity in the global system. All these things we would have to watch very carefully and take adequate action. One thing I do want to mention in this context, uh, although it's not directly related, is that um, uh, we have, uh, uh, to, to my mind, uh, we have mismanaged um, our exchange rate. So it is, it is heavily, heavily overvalued. I found in my archives, let me just show this. If you see this, can you read it? Yes, yes. Send so Rakesh. Send so China. Rakesh. Send Rakesh Mohan to China. We don't want to send you there. So you would be, you would be one of the precious. Twelfth uh, May two thousand seven, written by my friend Surjit Bhalla. Yeah. Uh, he was sending Rakesh Mohan to China, so that as deputy governor, I could learn from China how to manage the exchange rate. And uh, he says in this article um, that um, that for that. Um, uh, for every every ten percent depreciation causes five percent growth export growth. Ten uh, percent central central real depreciation adds at least two percent to GDP, or given a trillion dollar GDP, that is at least twenty billion. Yeah. Okay, I'm I'm uh, reading this out because his, because his view has become opposite today. So mm -hmm. uh, I would want to send him to China now. Um, so uh, the point really is that the biggest, now this is the medium term as opposed to the short term, the biggest thing we need to do um, is to make manufacturing much more competitive. Uh, our export to GDP, our, our merchandise trade export to GDP ratio has come down from 17% of GDP to around 11% of GDP from, from 2012. And we cannot generate employment intensive growth in the future without exports really going up. And um, the between 2002 and 2012, our merchandise trade export growth was higher than China, was higher than that of China, the growth rate. So there is no reason why we can't do that again. Uh, the difference is that exchange rate policy now, that we have a heavily over, uh, overvalued exchange rate, and there's no way there can be, and that is why that has given the rise to PLR we would be much better position, position to save those 200,000 crores and operate on a much more competitive uh, exchange rate. I understand that it's more difficult to do that now uh, because of many global uh, issues, particularly the particularly the United States. But I think we have the experience to manage the exchange rate in such a fashion. Uh, obviously, I'm not saying depreciate by any, any percent. I wouldn't say that ever. Uh, what I'm saying is that we need to have policies which give confidence to the private sector that we will have a competitive real exchange rate so that we can export. Uh, it doesn't make sense why Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh can have higher, Bangladesh can have higher growth rates in exports. And that's why, that's what I began uh, today, that the, what the private sector can do is to have much greater Atma Vishwas as, uh, as I see in the media today, uh, that Mr. Amitabh Khan said to the private sector also yesterday. That you have to have that we have to have much more upper vishwas and say look we can compete why not and i would also say that one of the big things that has changed last 20 years that despite the sorry record of the previous 50 years uh, there's been there been tremendous uh, improvement in education in the country even though we're still badly behind but huge improvement last 20 years and therefore it ought to be feasible much more today to get better educated more, uh, uh, more capable labor to do all the production that we need to do. And the way I put it is that we should be exporting like mad. Um, everything that you find in Walmart stores, and I'm saying Walmart because I lived in the United States in the previous 10 years. I used to go, I didn't just buy anything, I used to go as a hobby to Walmart and turn around every product and see where it was made. I could never find India. I found Bangladesh, I found Mexico, I found Ethiopia, and yeah, so no. I could never find India. And that is what uh, makes me feel that this is something we can do. And in some sense, use this slump period to learn and what we can do 
uh, which is what you saw, asked me right at the beginning about the private sector. Can do. I'm sort of, I veered away from the question of inflation, but somehow one thought led to another. No, fantastic. Well, that, that's, that's the uh, good thing about having you, how you try and, how, how do you not try, how you seamlessly link all this stuff. And uh, Rakesh, you know my views on the exchange rate. We've had this conversation before. Uh, we've had the conversation around uh, labor productivity and all of that, and that can consume you know, several hours of discussion, but uh, uh, which I shall have with you once uh, the lockdown is over and you are willing to come over uh, to my house. But, uh, but I, I want to uh, uh, now, there are many, many, many questions here, but I'd like to turn this to a couple of our past presidents who are on the call, uh, who want to also come in and ask something. Mr. Sudhir Jalan, you are, uh, you are there, I think, sir. I think you wanted to ask Rakesh, you've known him for very long. Mr. Jalan, still there, Rekha? Yeah, I can see him. Yeah, he, yeah He's okay. There. And you can... Is he unmuted to ask, or is he... Please unmute, um, Mr. Jalan. Yeah, he's still. Mr. Jalan, I think you can unmute yourself. He's not being able to do so for some reason. I think the host has to unmute him. Yeah. yeah. Now I've got him. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Rakesh. How are you? Hi, Sudhir. Nice to see you. After years, at, yeah. at least virtually, we have seen each other. Yes. Uh, well, I have had the privilege of knowing you for over 30 years, and uh, I consider you always the most pragmatic economist we have ever had, and the best gov RBI governor never had. Thank you. <laughs> you may say you, you're lucky that you are not here as a RBI or in government of India, but we wish you were here. You have answered two of those questions. I wanted to ask three. One was a very definite answer on the currency. And if you were here, things would have been very different, I can say with definite assurance. Second, on the fiscal deficit, you have answered very lucidly what should be done. I'd just then like to ask only one question. After the first wave of COVID, the recovery was rural led because the rural area was not affected much. This time, it seems to be the other way around. The rural area has been severely affected. So will and should the economy this time be urban led? Um, difficult questions, Dheer. Uh, again, as I said in the beginning, one just doesn't know enough. Um, but I'll just repeat a little bit what I said earlier, that um, um, given what is happening in the rural areas, uh, well, I, I, I can only assume, but I don't know enough, um, that they would have less resilience. They might have more, for all I know. Um, because it is certainly the case that, as of now, the expectation regarding crops uh, production is positive, still. So in that sense, they might well have more resilience. Um, so. Um, but at the same time, we have to remember that agriculture GDP is now less than 15%. Of so in that sense, ag agriculture, of course, agriculture is not equal to rural. Uh, but in that sense, agriculture can't really lead to recovery. It can cushion the damage if the production, etc., is doing well. Having said that, if it is the case, that the more rural people suffering, um, they might be able to, because of uh, home production, et cetera, they may, the, the suffering may be a little less because of home production and so on. But on the other hand, there may be non, sort of great, there would be a greater hit to non-rural incomes. I'm sorry, non-agriculture, non-agriculture rural incomes. But I just don't have enough information uh, on that. Um, I have only passed the uh, Azim Premji University and has done an excellent survey. Uh, and I would just, if you just go to the website, you'll find it. Uh, Professor Amit Basole has done an excellent job. I think it was the best survey available uh, to get some understanding. Of course, it, it was before the second, second wave. Um, so um, you need to uh, also, 
that the, the urban areas have also taken a huge hit in the second, second wave. Um, so it has to be a multi-pronged effort. I can't, really, I can't answer your question too well, I'm afraid, Sidhi, because I don't just don't have enough information. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Mr. Jalan, for that. Uh, if I can add my two cents, and you, you covered it actually by saying the urban area, I mean, it has to be multi-pronged. I think one of the things that is I've been feeling is that we need to look at a lot in terms of uh, urban employment, which sort of showed up for the first time very sharply after the first wave, you know, when you saw the migration. So the importance of this migrant, <clears throat> the urban employer, and therefore the whole thing was very important. Now, Mr. Jairaj, past president of IMA, also would like to ask you a question. Mr. Jairaj, would you Thank go you, ahead? Thank you, Mr. President. And um, so what do you mean? IASP are allowed to be IMA presidents? <laughs> well, you know, he was president much before my time, and I had no role in that, I can assure you. But he certainly, he is certainly valuable to IMA, I can say that. Much as the private sector may not have wanted Rakesh, <laughs> they had no choice. So, Rakesh, actually, I have seen your metamorphosis over the past four and a half decades from being an academic to a central banker to a policy uh, maker in the government of India, and now again heading a think tank. Okay. And so, putting all these hats together, Rakesh, I want you to. Please help us in understanding that from the public policy perspective, what would have been an ideal policy intervention in this second wave? And in that, in that light, Rakesh, the kind of public expenditure that is taking place, how should one target it effectively? Two short questions. The short questions, uh, but uh, impossible ones. Uh, let me uh, give you a very, very indirect answer. It's really not an answer. The first thing, I guess, particularly this audience will be surprised by is that the Indian government is too small. Let me repeat. The Indian government is too small and lacking in competence. Uh, I'm not talking about this particular government, I'm saying government in general. So I'm not mm -hmm. saying the current government is, is that this government, this current government is particularly small. It's just it's been it's been our feature. So to give you an to give you some numbers on this, um, central government employees, excluding railways, etc., uh, railways and P and T, we have about 1.6 government employees per thousand population. The United States which is among the smaller governments in the West, is eight per thousand, eight compared to our 1.6. The situation is much, much worse in terms of local governments, city governments, and state governments, in terms of uh, public personnel per thousand in comparison to most other countries. So my, the, the relevance to the question you asked is, that one of the reasons why we have difficulty in dealing with issues like this is because we just don't have enough government formations down the, you know, all the way down. You can't, I mean, one of the, I think that one of the things that we've learned is to the Kerala model, uh, which again, I don't know enough about, but whatever I read in the papers, et cetera, and some pap and other papers, that there were much more, much better structure, uh, public policy or public personnel formations down to the ground level. It is only then that you can address these issues that, we, that is confronting us. You can't do it on a macro basis. Yes, you can do expenditures on a macro basis, certainly, but how to, how to know what is needed at the local level? What, what is needed in Bangalore may be very different than what is needed in Delhi. Um, what, 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 is, what is needed in, in Bangalore will be very different is what maybe we need in other Karnataka districts. So that's one very general answer that one of the things we should learn from the experiences, why did we have difficulty coping with this, right? And therefore one can't give a specific, I can't give a specific solution because look, as I said, A, I was abroad, B, since I've come and sitting in my home where you see me in the study 90% of the time. Um, Having also, even with the low levels of uh, public personnel, 
one fifth of government uh, 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 slots are vacant any given time. One fifth. In terms of justice, one third of high court just, judges uh, slots are vacant. Um, one fifth of Supreme Court justice slots are vacant. Same thing goes for teachers across the country. So all I'm saying is, Gerard, that uh, if we, ha- I'm not saying, look, just expand the government like mad. It has to be, it has to be focused. But one of the, re- the uh, big reasons we've had difficulty is this. Uh, similarly, the United States had this difficulty despite the large personnel because the governmental system is not so efficient. That is why they have among the worst records in coping, coping with COVID. And uh, you need also much more domain knowledge. So, uh, uh, so, 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 you know, I'm giving you a very indirect answer because I don't know any better. No. Got it, Rakesh. Got it. We'll discuss it at length later. Right. Uh, thank you. I, I know that we are beyond time, and it's been a very absorbing session and, and all of that. I know Mr. is dying to go. So, Sunil, can we take your question as the last one? Yeah. Okay, great. I mean, hi, Rakesh. You know, I have wanted, I begin with, with Rakesh. I always like to begin with a little joke. I always hear, I always learn from the mistakes of people who took my advice. That's very important in life and all economists have always got to learn from the mistakes that of all the people that took your advice. But all I want to say is that, look, there's enough research to show that if money goes into the hands of the poor, they tend to spend. If money goes into the hands of the semi-rich and rich, and I'm not talking about the ultra-rich, they tend to save the money as because of the current situation. So look, ultimately, putting money in the hands of the, uh, of the rural area will lead to expenditure will lead to consumption, which is the oil in the engine. But is there what I have suggested to the government, but they are perhaps they'll take their own sweet time. They've looked at Say's law of saying supply, if they have looked after, it will have a trickle down effect on demand. But my thing is, how do you incentivize consumer expenditure? Give, don't give money directly to the mid- middle income group because they will tend to save. Incentivize them. If they take a flight, give them a tax off. If they take X, give them a tax off. What do you think about this move of incentivizing expenditure? Um, uh, for, for, for a change, Sunil, I couldn't agree with you more. It's very really surprising <laughs> to me. <laughs> um, the, uh, no, I agree fully with you that you need to provide uh, cash transfers to the poor. The, the tax hop... Um, uh, no. Tax hop doesn't work because everyone who everyone who pays taxes and triple the number of people who pay taxes and who should uh, don't no, no one deserves a tax hop quite frankly to to spend because um, we our tax GDP ratio is is much lower than it ought to be and by the way it's been stagnant for the last twelve years that's among the problems that we have big problems that we have. So I, I wouldn't go on the tax shop because the, the category of people you're talking about who should get cash transfers are not in the tax net. So that doesn't help. No, so I think just that that uh, that we should give cash transfers. I'm not able to say, look, below what income on how you actually do it. Right? But in principle, absolutely right at the present time that we should give cash transfers to the least well off. Um, and in some sense, uh, for example, some some self-selecting mechanisms that anyone who shows up for Manrega, give him double the wage. Yeah. Or double the wage. Because that's self-selecting. No one shows up to do that kind of work unless you're in real trouble. Right? Uh, people lining up in ration shops. People don't like, no one likes to run up ration shops. My very, very, very limited experience with the less well-off today, that is, given the COVID, any service person who shows up at my house to deliver something, right? I give more than I should, or not, not more than I should, more than more, more than necessary. But my experience is that people have tried. They don't like getting handouts for nothing. They all, usually they say, you know? So my point is that the, the people don't like getting handouts and they really need it. So I 100% agree with you, sir. Although I hate to admit it. <laughs> When I'm in Delhi next, we'll have a long chat. I'm going to come over. 
and we'll continue our conversation. But one always learns from you. That's all. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you. I, I, uh, you know, there are many more questions. I know Dr. Juneja has uh, his hand up and many others, but I'm afraid uh, we'll have to, all good things have to come to an end. And I, otherwise, I'll be accused of uh, of spoiling Rakesh, and his wife will give me a, a dressing down, which, which uh, I wouldn't like from a lovely person like her. So, uh, uh, Rakesh ji, thank you so much for for being here with us. Uh, friends, I'm sure you <clears throat> you agree that it's been a very interesting and fascinating session. Uh, and and really, uh, if I may say, uh, without uh, seeming to to be understood uh, otherwise, uh, Rakeshji, your <clears throat> your comprehension and multi-dimensional understanding of issues was was clearly visible in this conversation. And uh, as you rightly put it. It is not one issue alone that we have to deal with. And therefore, your experience, both in India and abroad, and your observations are very, very useful. And, uh, and really, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we had a lot of people. We had more than 300 odd people on this call. Plus, we have had uh, more than that number uh, via Twitter, Facebook, and so on and so forth. So, so um, and going by the the number of questions unanswered or people who are interested um, shows that people are really interested in hearing you. Thank you very much on behalf of IMA. And we will, um, now that you're back in India, uh, you were away for 10 years, but you're going to be here, I hopefully, uh, now onwards, at least for quite some time. So we will take the opportunity of interacting again with you. And um, thank you all uh, those who participated in this session. And um, I'm sure it, it was very interesting for all of you. Thank you, Rekha. Do you have any other points to make there? No, I just want to thank Dr. Rakesh Mohan and uh, say what a pleasure it is to see him after many, many years, as I think uh, Mr. Jalan and somebody else mentioned. And I hope we can stay enga engaged with uh, Dr. Mohan as I am. And I uh, apologize to all the members who have not, we have not been able to take your questions. There have been just so many questions for Dr. Mohan, but hopefully, as uh, Mr. Singhania said, we'd be able to uh, organize another interaction with him going forward. So thank you so much, Dr. Mohan, and thank you, Mr. Singhania, for sharing this so well. And thank You're you great. all for attending. I'm, I'm personally happy that Dr. Rakesh Mohan is here because through the banner that you see behind him, CSEP, the organization that he heads now as president, uh, a lot of your thoughts, uh, Rakesh Ji, will, I'm sure, come out of CSEP's thinking and uh, and get to policymakers. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Harsh. I should mention to all the members here that uh, Harsh is uh, one of our Founder Circle members, our founder members of CSEP. Uh, my only problem today is I have to get more money out of him for a second fundraising drive. So I, I, I think on that note, I should leave now and <laughs> just let it go. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a great disclaimer. Thank you. Thank you, Rakeshi. Bye bye.